Welcome to Taking Care of Lady Business, where we put the business back in lady business. Hosted by Jennifer Justice, founder and CEO of the Justice Department, a management strategy and law firm that works with female and woke male entrepreneurs, executives, talent, brands, and creatives to build and maximize their wealth, focusing in the areas of tech, consumer product, finance, media, entertainment, and fashion. Jennifer interviews entrepreneurial women who have done it all, who will be sharing their secrets on all things business, especially as a woman. These highly successful women will share strategies and insights, including what not to do and what it takes to win. And now, here's your host, Jennifer Justice. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Taking Care of Lady Business. I have a guest on today that would sound too crazy to be true because her name is basically a short version of mine. Her name is Jenny Just, and I am Jennifer Justice, as you know. <laughs> Jenny Just, however, is uh, makes me look like a preschooler comparison and to her insanely successful career as the founder of Peak Six. We're going to hear all about her and how she is helping women by teaching them poker to excel in business and fast track in business, as we were just discussing. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Hi. So nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being on here. I'm super excited. Since I heard your name, I was like, how is a person named Jenny Just and Jennifer Justice? You're a Jennifer, though, I take it, too. I am a Jennifer, Jennifer. Yeah. 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 You know, um, it's just too good to be true. So I'm so happy when we finally met a few months ago, and I'm so happy that we can have you here. So I want to start by talking about what Peak Six is and um, how you got into it. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate and appreciate your audience listening today. Um, Peak Six, many people haven't heard about it. It's a private company. We've been around for 25 years. We started as a proprietary trading company, which means we trade our own money. But we have grown really into uh, a fintech, I would say, powerhouse. So for most of you who are listening, you would have an app on your phone with where you do your um, banking and your trading and your investing, 50 to 60% of those apps, the backend technology is comes from one of our firms called Apex FinTech Solutions. So that's how most people would know us. Other than that, we have our proprietary trading firm, which we've had, like I said, for 25 years, helped us to make money, allowed us to do these other things. Apex FinTech Solutions, like I just said, and then we have an insure tech business. We have an edu tech business. We're in esports, and like you mentioned, we're now trying to to help women excel in business through an entity called Poker Power. So it's really a company of companies, mm -hmm. and mostly in the fintech space. And we've I've had a great opportunity to be a, one of the few female in my business, and we're trying to change that. I mean, and for 25 years, and you're still one of the only, you know, few people. <laughs> yeah, no, it's business, not good. Which is yeah. crazy, right? So right. when you first started out, you were like, there is nobody around. Like, That's right. That looks like me. <laughs> I was on the trading floor, right? All the screaming and yelling, yeah. like all men, thousands and thousands of them. I say it was like a sporting event, except for there was just a handful of women who were down there. But I did grow up with four brothers. So it wasn't terribly unusual to me. So I really, I got lucky being there and doing that as my first job, but I was certainly not typical. So what made you want to do that? What was it about it that was like so interesting knowing that you would literally be one, the only woman on that floor? Yeah, yeah, no, it was totally accidental. So really, I, yeah, it was totally accidental. I grew up in Wisconsin. I went to school at the University of Michigan and all I wanted to do, the big city for me was Chicago. Yeah. So all I did was interview at companies that were in the Chicago area. And one of them was this company called O'Connor Associates. And I was super lucky um, to this day, some of the best years of my career to work for this company, which was really other than like two others, premier options trading firm in the world. Uh, it eventually was bought by a, a large bank, 
but I got to start there and I honestly didn't know my first day was going to be on a trading floor because I interviewed in the office yeah. and I didn't really understand what the world was all about. I didn't understand what my job was. I was just, I was happy to be working there. In fact, it was one of the few places that it was like early Google. Like you walked in there and everybody was dressed casual. I, I go into a bank and interview or another company and, you know, I was dressed up in a suit and like pantyhose or so. Yeah. I was super excited to be there. They had haagen and beer in the fridge. And I was like, what is this? I'm in. So I really, uh, it's truly accidental. And I have to say they were quite forward thinking, right? That they hired me. Yeah, that's a- so true. It's so true. But like, how did you know what you were doing? Like what, like, so for the total novice, right? Because a lot of women aren't in, uh, aren't investing in, in the stock market. And that's what we're trying to get more women to do. Like what is options trading? And like, how do you, how did you know what you were doing? Right. So I was very lucky. They had a training program, right? So they taught us what to do. But options are, if you think of a stock, if you buy or sell a stock, they're a derivative of buying or selling the stock. I now will buy or sell the stock in the future. Mm -hmm. So if I buy a call option or I sell a call option, if I buy a put option or I sell a put option, each one of those give me a right in the stock to do something in the future. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely complicated. I always say on the, the curve of financial products, it's on the far right. Yeah. The beauty of it. And one of the reasons we've been trying so hard to get more women involved is, is if you can learn that, I tell the young women who come, we started this, the women's trading experience six or seven years ago, and it's been an absolute blessing for our organization and also opportunity for women. Um, if you can learn this skill, which is quite specific I believe that you can sit at any table, at any level, in any company, at any company, in any industry, and understand what's happening with the money. Mm -hmm. That's how beneficial I believe that learning that product has been to me. Now, not everybody's going to go out and do that, I understand. But I do think sort of this world of what I call capital allocation, young women are missing out on that opportunity. They hear hear the word trading. it's, It's like poker as well. They just look away. They believe it's not for them. And that's absolutely not the case. And that's where a lot of the money gets made. So I would say I was lucky and I obviously stuck with it. So how long were you there? And then when did you start your own firm then? So I was there almost seven years Yeah, and I would have stayed. In fact, you know, today we look like, you know, we're the typical entrepreneur, but at the time, right, that wasn't really discussed. And the bank head was buying the company and they were moving headquarters out east and my family, et cetera, was in the Midwest. So I wasn't planning on moving. So I did have the opportunity inside of O'Connor to help start a business, which was called the -the over-the-counter equity derivative business. Again, another version, it's basically off exchange floor um, options trading. Mm -hmm. So like large corporations, you know, your General Motors, your Intels, your Microsofts in their corporate finance departments, they also use options, but they use it at such large scale that it typically doesn't happen on the exchange floor. It will happen sort of bank to company. Yeah. And that was the opportunity. I got to be part of that and grow that business. So I really was building a business inside a business in my mid twenties. So when I left the bank, when they moved, my co-founder and myself, we said, well, we'll just do that again, which was quite naive, honestly. So, but obviously we, we did, we did, we didn't do our plan A. We always say we're a little bit slow. It's 25 years later. We still didn't do our plan A, but we did plan B. Right. And that was to use technology actually to do the same thing that was happening on the exchange floors. And we were one of the very first to do that. And so how does your, how does peak six work today? The, the main, you know, business that you started. So yeah. You really understand. Yeah. So there are about 2000 people under the umbrella of peak six. There are multiple operating companies that I, I mentioned earlier. Each one of those, we have amazing partners who run each of those businesses. They're all private companies today. There's the possibility that one of those could be a public company in the future but the unique, I would say the the heart and soul of the business has always been that trading business. And people often will go from business to business across Peak 6 because of the core sort of education and technology that we teach people when they first come in. But we have, of course, lots of people come into our insure tech business separately or our edutech business or 
Apex FinTech Solutions. So it's quite a large sort of FinTech, uh, I would say, you know, almost empire today. Uh, it, it's a strong word to use, but to understand the complexity of what goes on inside there, we're touching a lot of the products that sit under the finance umbrella today, and oftentimes the first in terms of technology. So when fractional shares came out, Apex FinTech Solution was the first one to do that. God. I mean, we can back up before that. When Robinhood got its start, they got our its start on the back of uh, Apex's technology. So we like to think we're at the forefront of the next things that are coming in the FinTech arena. Now we're stepping into insurance and we're stepping into the education space. Um, we're doing the same thing in esports. So uh, it's like, oh, have a lot of fun. Esports seems so removed from from it does yeah it does so i mean we have the luxury of being a private company and yeah um, making choices we had historically been in traditional sports a little bit but when esports came online we thought oh well this looks and acts similar to some of these other businesses that we're doing and so we did get involved we actually have a young woman uh, nicole lapoint jameson who was running that business for us she's a superstar came out of school was in our boot camp, was in the investment side of our business and and on the operating side. And when this opportunity came up, she had been in gaming and said she would take the role. So we we made a bet on her. She made a bet on us. And three years later, you know, we're one of the top uh, three teams in the top five games in the world. Um, you know, she's a 30 under 30. She's done an extraordinary job. The company was in trouble. The Evil Geniuses was when we took it over. Um, it was involved in the Twitch Amazon merge and or purchase and they had to divest of the team and it got in the hands of the players and that's not their skill of course so yeah it, we picked it up in in spring of 19 and have turned around that business and and thanks to Nicole being in there so it was a great opportunity for us for her to you know leverage what she had already been doing with us but also take a risk and see if she could manage doing this business for us so and turn it around. Amazing. Around, so yeah. you started with peak six, like the, the core business, right? Yep. And the then you, business, like, yeah. you just kept like growing and building right. and growing and building. And how long after you started in options trading, did you start your own company? You know, seven and a half years, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was later twenties um, when we started our trading business. And then from there, what ended up happening with the trading business, we got a little bit lucky. Like I said, we were early, one of the first to be uh, trading off floor as opposed to on the exchange floor using technology. And when we made money, extra money, sometimes in the trading business, you don't put it back into the business. And we started to try to do other things. In fact, we had a brokerage ourselves that we built. It was called Options House. It was eventually built... Um, we ran it for nine years and then merged it with another company sold, eventually went under E-Trade. So we've had the unique opportunity, I would say more than 15 companies that we've either started or bought and turned around mm -hmm. over the course of the last 25 years. I mean, you are like the definition of an entrepreneur. You yes. Know? yes. <laughs> Little did I know that about myself, but it turns out, yes, we are. I mean, it's incredible. And, you know, one of the only self-made billionaire females, right? You know, so there's not a lot of you and hoping for more. hoping, obviously hoping yeah. for more, but, <laughs> you know, like I, I find a lot of the times, you know, I work with a lot of female uh, founders and, and because it's so new and because there's so little like education and financial, you know, experience and experience and, m a or, you know, like, you know, in the music industry, a big thing is JVs and helping, you know, JVs. And, and it's just like a vehicle that's just so underutilized. And there's so many people on women, in particular, female founders operating in silos that if you just join together, join together, you know I what see. I mean? And build it together instead, like it could go so much faster or we sell the company before you think that you're ready or you've had like, That's you know, right. take that money before you have to start raising and raising and own less and less and less and less, less percent of your company. Because we've all heard the stories of the female founder who has a billion dollar company, but owns 0.5%. That's right. And you know what I mean? If she didn't take that last money or five years before could have sold it for 150 million and like kept most of it. You know what I mean? The um, one of the things that Peak Six we've always said it, the most important thing is it's it's a partnership. 
Yes, we have CEOs of our businesses, but I consider them my partners. And I think women, you know, oftentimes you're the only one going into it. So you don't have that opportunity for a partner, but it's really critical to find those people that you could, you know, share the that journey with. Mm-hmm. And the fact that it's not about 52 partners when you raise all that money, right? right? It's about hopefully a couple really great partners that can help you go from A to B to C. So you have enough so that when you have to do those raises. Now, I was fortunate that we didn't have to back then. And then we basically had this trading machine that was making money, allowed us to do other things. So it is, it is ours. We've had, you know, one or two outside raises in separate entities that don't even really exist anymore. So it's still all ours. And I'm super grateful that I did it. You know, it's, it's a marathon, right? It's not a sprint. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the, the previous market that we saw made everybody feel like they had to sprint and give up and raise quickly, right? If you take the biggest companies in the world, the Facebook, the Amazon, et cetera, how much money did they all collectively raise before they went public? And it's some de minimis amount of money that they actually were, you know, I don't know, some number like $250 $250 million. I don't even know what the number is. We should fact check that. I heard it recently, but it's an extraordinarily low dollar amount. And right. so for our women to know to not race to get those others. And you can do a lot with a little. I think yeah. that's what we've always we've always preached. Yeah, because everyone's getting the opposite message. Like, you know, I don't want to invest as a VC if it's less than, you know, millions of dollars because I want to make millions of dollars. And it's right. like, I know, but what about profits? What about those things, you know? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And I think the market lent itself to that and allowed for some of that. Um, Of course, uh, you know, we grew up when the market wasn't like that and rates were much higher that back then as well too. So it was a totally different mentality. So I think I got lucky. It made us do, you know, make those profits to go to the next step being in the middle of this one and now switching to a totally, it's like you landed on a different planet with the same company, you know, in 48 hours. So it's hard for entrepreneurs to make that switch. Hopefully, you know, our people can make it to the other side of this, but it's probably longer than people expect. And I don't know that we're ever going back to that other way. So you really have to think about a different way of managing. I actually just sat in a room with a group of young women and one woman was an entrepreneur in the last three to five years. The other woman looks is a very senior woman at a S&P 500 company. And the entrepreneur asked the question, what do I do? Or how do I think about my costs? Because when I'm going and raising money now, they're talking to me about this, mm-hmm. right? And asking the room and people, various people answered. Well, later that night, the woman at the large company said, that's what I've been doing for the last, you know, she'd been working for 20 years, right? Every, you know, three to five years, I'm thinking about that. It's not, it's such a surprise for a new entrepreneur that somebody's asking for those, a profitable bottom line. And it really is how a proper business should run. Now, of course, Amazon, we all know that, right? Didn't make money for a very, very long time. Again, unique situation, but I think we have to be far more prudent than if you're not doing that today, you're obviously seeing it with all the large companies are doing it. But if you're not doing it yourself as a young company, you're making a big mistake because it's not going to get easier before it gets harder. Yeah, no, 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 true. I I think another example is WeWork, you know? (laughs) Yeah, like, exactly. Wait, you're leasing office space and you have billions of dollars? I don't understand this. I need a model. Exactly. Not like that. Not like I'm saying I'm a genius, but I always went and looked. Right, right. That way. Not understand this <laughs> at all. I guess I'm not okay. very smart because somebody, you know what I mean? But sometimes you got to trust your own intuition as a woman. And that's another common theme in this whole podcast. It's, you know, everyone who's, you know, been on this and successful, they've always trust their instincts. And they're like, this, this, this doesn't seem right. So let's go a little bit to, um, you know, how, like you had mentioned before, you guys have a program for women investing, et cetera. And now you've started something else, which is so fascinating. And that is this whole area about teaching women how to play poker. Yes. Yes. So this was, it seems like a lot of things happen accidentally in my life, but this was definitely accidental and um, happened just going on uh, four years. It was spring of 19 when this happened. And my daughter actually had four kids, my uh, three boys and and a girl. And my daughter was 14 at the time and playing a tennis match. 
and her dad came home and he was super frustrated, didn't want to yell at her. So he yells at me and says, because she's a very good athlete and should be winning, not winning, that she may as well be hitting against a wall mm-hmm. or hitting with her teacher. She doesn't realize that she's playing against someone and she's really strategizing about what's going on in the court based on the skills they brought to the game, but also what's happening in the game. She needs to learn to play poker and walks away. And of course, I didn't say anything. Rather, I should say I walked away because he was he was he was the one that was yelling. And yeah. by the way, he didn't play poker and I didn't play poker. Though it's very common for, you know, especially in our trading business, people play poker. In fact, I would say I was anti-poker, waste of time. That was where my headspace was. Two weeks later, I like it literally just popped into my head. I was like, should I teach my 14-year-old daughter to play poker? And it sounded so strange. And then it bothered me that it sounded so strange because if I had said it about one of my sons, it wouldn't have been strange at all. So then I was annoyed and pissed, like, what kind of world do we live in that I can't like, that's wrong for her, but right for him. So anyway, fast forward, I end up saying to her friend's moms, I was like, I just want to do a little experiment. Just can your daughter do this with me? And the moms were like, oh, wait, can we do it too? So 10 girls, 10 moms for one hour lessons over four weeks. And lesson one to lesson four, the skies opened. I always say that because it was it was incredible, the difference between the girls in the beginning and the girls at the literally four one hour lessons. And by the way, these the women in our women's trading experience program at Peak Six, they were our teachers because I knew, of course, they weren't. Well, I didn't know how to play. Let's start there. Yeah. But I to learn from these young 20 year olds. Right. And um, in the beginning, it was they were whispering right? To each other about what to do. If someone lost their chips, they're like, you can have my chips. Yeah. Or like, you know, fast forward to the fourth week and they were sitting up tall, they were peeking at their cards and they, nobody was taking their goddamn chips. Yeah. It was incredible. <laughs> I was like, what just happened here? Oh my God. I love so, it. Of course I'm learning as we're going along. And as we start to piece this together, of course, we, I'm thinking, gosh, if the, if high school girls or college girls can do this before they get to where we know, right. It's not maternity leave. It's a first rung on the ladder where women fall behind. They don't take the risk because they don't have 90% confidence and the guy will take it with 60% confidence. If we can get to them before that time, right. We can help them. Right. Because yeah. all of a sudden I started seeing on this poker table, it was unfolding like literally before my eyes. This is my work. This is what I do every yeah. day. The way the people play the game, the way it rotates around, the power, the chip dynamic, the betting. I was like, this, how is this poker table like that boardroom table or that negotiation or that meeting that I'm sitting in? All of a sudden I was like, what? guys are actually practicing something. They don't even know it, right? Where's, you know, and they're just having fun. Yeah. What are they really learning? So as I started to play more, we start, and then of course we go into COVID. We said, well, we know how important it is for those girls to sit at that table. So we'll see you when this thing is over. And of course, then it wasn't over. And we started to do Zoom. The women at Peak Six, they heard what we were doing because we said, well, can we talk to your daughters and your nieces? And, And they said, well, what about us? Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't know. I guess so, right? Because we had been teaching the women in our training program, just really more as a filler, right? Mm-hmm. Than anything else. Not because I didn't know better. And so we started teaching the women, and one thing led to another. The an outside firm heard what we were doing. Morningstar, large international firm. Today we are in forty countries. We've been teaching at corporates and associations and women's programs and conferences all around the country. We know this thing helps women with negotiation. Mm -hmm. We know it helps them think strategically. We know it helps with capital allocation. And we know it helps them practice taking risk. Now, I cannot prove all of that yet. We are in the middle of doing research on the program, but I can tell you every single day, that I have women telling me what they just did that they wouldn't have done if it hadn't been. Literally, it's for the, I always say, you know, this is a, this is a long-term game. You can play once and understand and go and play with your friends, but you really want to get the effect. It's like exercise. Mm -hmm. You want to practice because then you start to practice different strategies and different approaches. And then somebody new comes to the table and 
all the the flower just keeps opening a little bit further, another aperture to, wow, that just looked like that meeting I was in yesterday. Mm -hmm. What could I have done differently? What cards did I have? What is the storyline that's happening at the poker table? Just like the storyline. Is it really a narrative? Right. Uh, that happens at the table. So anyway, it's been this unbelievable opportunity for us to, to go out and talk to women, teach women, and then create a community of hopefully where we want to get to a million, you know, God forbid, you know, there's over a hundred million men in the world that play poker or people in the world that play poker, probably over 120 million don't really know the data, less than 7% maybe are women. Yeah. I actually had a woman on here, Ashley Priori, who was one of the number one chess champions. Uh, that's and, amazing. Like we she, love our chess players. Yeah. Yeah. She's like 22 and, you know, still like thinks about going to politics. And whenever she talks to people, they say to her, even knowing that she was a chess champion. Oh yeah. You don't need to run though. You can just like be like the campaign manager. And she's like, oh my oh, God, I'm 22. This is already <laughs> happening to me. This is, this is already, It's hard to believe. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Right. But fascinating. It, but it, yeah, but it's great because, you know, look, what I do and help women do is negotiate salaries, et cetera, and help them. But really what I'm doing is like, you know, look, I get hired to do it for people all the time, right. but they have to be behind what I'm going to do. And Absolutely. to do that, I'm basically life coaching them and teaching them strategy and what their worth is, you know, right. and a lot of that is fact based because I know what the market is and, and I know, but you know, they're, but you're right. It's like, at first they're like sitting there fiddling with their cards. I'm like, Oh no, they can't afford it. You know, it's like, right. what do you care if you're cut? You don't own the company. Exactly. Like, right. Like, exactly. You know what I mean? you so what we always talk about with poker. So you get two cards to start. And I, I know you and I talked earlier that we're, you're, we're going to teach you poker, but yes. you know, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. You get the two cards to start and you have to decide what you're going to do. But it, it ultimately, like that's sort of level one. Like, what am I going to do with my cards? But then I have to think about what the other person's cards mm -hmm. are, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to put myself in their shoes. And then I have to think about what they think my cards are. Right. So there's these different levels that go on. And if I go into negotiation for my salary and I'm only thinking about myself, I haven't opened myself up to allowing for a conversation that is between two people, not just one person wanting something from the other one. And because it may not be about getting your top, but it might be about getting something or it might be about getting something in the future. Now, when I play a poker hand, I don't know. It's only it's just one hand in a game. Right. But there's there are many hands that are going to happen. So I have to figure out strategically. I'm going to not just play that hand, but play all the hands mm -hmm. based on where I'm sitting, based on how many chip, what my chip stack is. Right. What is my strength? Where is it coming from? Because positionally, the the dealer button goes around the table. So my position changes as the game goes on. I know more information later in position. Mm -hmm. So what information do I know going into that meeting? And do I wait for it or don't I wait for it? What kind of risk do I take? And then how do I do it in a calculated way, mm -hmm. right? So it's a really fun opportunity. Like we talk about women negotiating their mortgages. We talk about women negotiating their salaries. Like we talk about women negotiating. I mean, just a woman the other day was this real estate developer. She did her biggest deal she ever did. She said, if I hadn't learned the concept of checking, which is just passing to see what, to get more information, right? right? It's creating a framework for women to think about what they're doing, right? Yeah. So if I have this framework and it's in this box of a game. And now I take that box and I put it into my work life. Now I can compare it to the next time I have a similar situation and the next time I have a meeting or it's slightly different. And I have the components to talk about where my cards different was my chip stack different was my position different. And today, as a result of playing poker, I am using that analogy all the time. In fact, my co-founder who never played poker, he's using it too. And we're like, what cards do you think we have? Oh no, I definitely have Jack nine offsuit. He's like, no, we definitely have a pair of Queens. And I was like, <laughs> I don't think so. And then we go through it and we talk about um, why and what, and then we see what kind of opportunity do we want to make from that? Because yeah. at some point you also might fold that opportunity, right? Exactly. What it also teaches you about adaptability and losing quickly and then getting back up. Right. You know, exactly. and I mean, which is another thing it's like, 
because if you're, you know, a woman that runs a household and an entrepreneur, it's like the slightest thing gets you off kilter and you go like, you know, like your housekeeper calling in sick or your babysitter, your nanny or whatever. And then your work and like, you know, or your, you know, today my printer wasn't working and it's just like all these things that you just think, but it's like, okay, adaptability and being able to like move through the things quickly. So you don't get paralyzed. Right. What we Um, love for our young women is the every hand is an opportunity and you may not succeed, but you practice failing and you practice coming back to the game. Exactly. Being ready for the next hand. Um, We don't have those, that kind of practice. Typically women, you know, if you're playing sports, you'll often see that type, but it's hard to find ways that we practice that kind of decision-making so fast. I had a, a woman who's head of HR the other day. I was listening to her talk about why she joined poker and she said, well, one of the reasons is I'm in a face-to-face business all the time. And, you know, I have to listen. I have to have, you know, the right reaction at the right time. It's very sensitive information. But also, I don't think I'm quick enough on my toes making decisions. And, you know, in a poker hand, in an hour, you're going to get f- practice making 50 decisions. Right. Um, maybe more. And so if I can do that over and over and over again, and then I see the patterns that happen when I make certain decisions and I fail, you know, some percentage of the time, I get okay with that. I know I can play again. Right, right. So how does this company work? Can anybody hire you? Can, how does, how do we do this? Yeah, (laughs) it's great. It's super easy. Pokerpower.com. You can sign up for every month. We have a new cohort of lessons that happen just from random people who come. So you do it online, uh, Zoom and on an app. We have what we call the first gender neutral poker app. We're just launching it in the last six weeks. So we're super excited about that. It's called Poker Power Play. And your companies can hire us to do it. So that has been extraordinary, actually, to to get inside the largest tech companies in the world, largest banks, largest law firms. And sometimes they'll start at the top and some people will start at the bottom, meaning more junior group of women. But the beauty of this is typically nobody knows how to play. So you can take women all different ages, all different seniority levels all together at the same time. The other interesting way people use this is they take uh, women from their company and their clients. And so now you're growing a relationship with your client through the game of poker. That mm-hmm. has been really interesting for especially our law firms. And then finally, because our app is now being launched, you can go on and we have uh, a partnership with one of our edgy tech companies, Zogo, which is online financial literacy. So we have poker modules right in our app. So you can learn right in there and then just start to play from there. But I think, you know, the other biggest way that we're doing today, which is how we originally met, is getting women, groups of women together and calling Peak Six. And, you know, it might be a friend group. It might be, you know, uh, an association. It might be a philanthropic group. And Peak Six will will bring a teacher, rather Poker Power, sorry, will bring a teacher and help you do that event. And the most interesting thing that's been happening, this just started, is getting sponsors so we're seeing banks, law firms, we're sponsoring, bringing poker power in to have those events for women. In fact, we're doing a couple this week, sponsored by banks in, in New York, one on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, one of them inside a law firm. And I say, you know, whenever I'm around large groups of C- men CEOs, I say it is, it starts top down. It is the responsibility of your organization to teach these women, the skills they need Mm -hmm. in order to excel at the same rate as a man, because, you know, we can make a salary the same. And next thing you know, it's nine, 10 months later and the salaries are different again. Yeah. And so part of that is it is the responsibility of the woman, but it's also responsibility of that business to make sure her skills are kept up and her ability to negotiate, her ability to take risk is put at the forefront. And one of the ways we can do this is by having our women play poker. Yeah, I mean, that's such a good point. And I, I make this point, you know, in different ways all the time when I'm talking to like a, a big, you know, Fortune 500 company. I was doing a deal for a woman there, but I like, you know, in my previous life, we were partners with them. So I knew them all very, very well. And and she and the one of the general counsels, a woman was like, you know, what do you think we're doing wrong here? Because every time we try to do this and I said, well, first of all, like you give somebody an employment agreement and you, and you literally send it to them and say, sign it and their C-suite level. Right. 
Okay. You don't do that to men. I know you don't. You ask yep. who their attorneys are. Yep. And you should be saying that to them too. Who's your attorney that's going to negotiate this for you? That's okay. Fine. Because, you know, at a certain level, you're not going to negotiate for yourself. But if you know enough about negotiation, you're going to help with your attorney exactly. figure out where you're going to go. Exactly. But the other part as a woman, you know, so there's the company part, but as a woman, you have to ask yourself, if you don't negotiate for yourself, is the company really going to take you that seriously? That you're, right. They're going to negotiate on their behalf. You know what I mean? And it's like, they're going to treat you the same way once you're in there. And then once they fire you, which happens all the time, you know, they, well, woman won't hire me going in thinking, oh, it's too expensive. And then will call me when they get fired. And it's become now four times more expensive. Exactly. <laughs> because, exactly. Like, you know, and, and trying to get all the stuff that they would have gotten if they hired me in the first place, or they knew to negotiate for themselves in the first place, right? You got it. You got to think about that. It's like, what is your company going to think of you if you can't negotiate for yourself? Are they going to put you in those same rooms? They might still right. want to hire you, but they're not going to give you that. They're going to go, wait, they didn't negotiate at all for anything when I hired them. Exactly. The opportunity, right? If you never at a poker table, you start, there's the aunties, small and big blind, and you have to, it goes around the table. And so there's always two. So there's money in the game, mm -hmm. in the pot, every game, every round. And you as a sitting at that table, if you don't ever use your chips, they'll eventually just get taken by the ante, right? You can yeah. fold your cards. You get your two cards, you fold. You get your two cards, you fold. In fact, 80%, I mean, uh, pros fold their first two cards 80% of the time, roughly. But if you fold 100% of the time, if you don't make, if you don't use your chips, um, I love this. Annie Duke was the one who originally started this. Use your chips as your voice. It's yeah. an opportunity, right? to ask a question. It's an opportunity to make a statement. It's an opportunity to do something by using your chips. And that's what we have to do when we're sitting at that room, when we're having that, that salary negotiation. It's not a sit and wait, yeah. see what happens to you because your chips eventually will go away. Yeah. Um, so we have to have a voice. I always say like, if you're sitting in a meeting and you went into a meeting and you walked out of a meeting and never said anything, you actually were worse off being in that yes. meeting having been in that meeting, you may as well not go. So if you're not prepared to use your chips, you actually lost, you know, wealth, power, you know, whatever, some to Asian, some degree, yeah. right. When you left. So that's the beauty of this, that I think using a framework to help you understand what you're doing. And, um, you know, subconsciously men have been doing that. Right. Yeah. Like you said yeah. they're immediately, they're going to negotiate. Cause I never didn't negotiate. I always yeah. talk about when we first started this, my, my then at the time, 16 year old son, I didn't know he knew how to play. And like, and he's out, I was, it was right during COVID. He was going to play, you know, ping pong outside with a friend. I'm like, why don't you play ping pong with us anymore? And he's like, okay, so we play for money. And I was like, okay, first of all, who's money? But second of all, <laughs> of course you are right. Like, yeah. and my daughter would never have said that. So he's no. at 16, right. And probably earlier, he's doing that negotiation every time, every little bit he can. Yeah. And we're not doing that. So we don't have that practice. So it isn't natural for us. So we need to get practice doing that in order for it to be natural. And yeah. by the way, for also people to expect it from us, because then when we do it, it's like, God forbid, you know, that it's such a surprise. I and know. It be a surprise, right? Yes. Yes, I know. And yeah, exactly. No, you just said it so succinctly. And, you know, and I think, you know, the other thing is we do come about, about it, honestly, women and men, we are, we do have a different chromosome. There's something yeah. about that that changes, like how we want to be more community driven, et cetera, last year. And this, like, you know, and then I'll, and then I'll eventually let you go. My, I have nine-year-old twins and they, um, boy girl and for their last birthday you know my son oh, i want to go to you know this water park that's you know an american dream you know i want to go and i was like well if you want to go you can only have a few friends my daughter wanted to have more friends and but so she was trying to like find something to do and i was like nothing everything kind of seemed like lame she kind of done everything before and i was like oh i finally went nico do you want to go to the water park and she's like well yeah but i thought you'd say no i said you get zero percent of what you don't ask for Right. Okay. That's you exactly never asked it. me. No, I yep. have to ask me and advocate for what you want. You might not yes. like the answer, but you need to ask. 
And she yeah. was like, okay, can I go? And I was like, obviously now you're going because yes. <laughs> you know what I that's mean? Great. Julie had one that's a great, that, that's a great lesson. And by the way, um, so we do a lot of mother daughter poker, yeah. but they can learn as early as age seven, eight. Yeah. So I know. your I'm daughter excited. is, is definitely ready. And then you'll see, and when yeah. she starts to use your chips, you'll be surprised. And when she doesn't, you'll encourage her. So yeah. Good, good for mama justice here. That, that's, that's <laughs> well, good for mama just for starting it all. <laughs> um, this yeah. is amazing. Thank you so much. I know that we, you know, as we already, you know, talked about, you're probably the most accomplished entrepreneur I've, I've ever met in my life. Um, <laughs> and good. just like such an inspiration to women in general. And uh, just love how, you know, making money, like, don't feel bad about it. Like, do it, make money and, and help right. women strategize to make more money because, right. you know what, it makes your life a lot more convenient and anxiety is real when you have no money. I My mom didn't graduate high school. We grew up on welfare. It is, it takes up all of your time, you know, when you just don't feel like you've gotten what you really deserve or, you know, in work and having those choices. So thank you so much. Before I let you go, I ask everybody the same question. And that is, and I'm sure you have some good ones. What is the worst advice you've ever received? Yeah, this is funny. I know you asked this and I, and I appreciate this because it makes, it made me think, and I, I have a long list of course, but you know, I realized something recently. So I, I did a TEDx with my daughter on poker actually in, in September, so, which is fun. Um, and she talked about how applied to her and learning. And, and I talked about me, but one of the things I realized when we were going, we were making that speech is one of the, the things I have said to women for many years. So this is my own bad advice I was giving to women, which is you have to have an opinion. And what I realized from playing poker, actually, it's not good enough just to have an opinion. You have to act on your opinion. So your daughter, if she had an opinion, she just didn't do anything about it. And I thought what I was telling women was that you have to act on your opinion when you have an opinion, but that's not obvious. Yeah. And so um, you can be conscious and fold your cards and not have an opinion in that case at that moment at that time. That's also an option for you but you have to think about the action you're taking as a result of those thoughts, because you have really good thoughts that need to be put on the table. And if you don't, you don't take a risk and put them out there, right? That is a setback for you and an advancement potentially for somebody else. Um, True. So I would say that that, that action as critical as it is um, having the, the thought to begin with. Right. Amazing. Thank you so much. So people want to find, um, how to, you know, join power poker, all of the, like, how do we do that? Yeah. So you can find me at jennyjust.com. You can find poker power. At I, poker I said power. Way, sorry. <laughs> yep. People do it all the time. It's okay. As long as we're saying it, um, we're, we're happy. The, um, and then if, if people are interested in seeing all the businesses, peak six has peak six.com. Yeah. I mean, I think it was interesting, all the training programs for women as well that yep. you have, like, it's insane. Thank you so much for being this amazing advocate for women. Thank you so much for starting this. I think it is such a great way to learn without being like, how do you learn how to negotiate? You know, then, <laughs> no. um, and it's like, fun. It's really yeah. fun. And it's yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, I love it. And thank you so much for coming on this. It was, this was awesome. I learned so much. I can't wait to like join. I'm going to literally sign up um, right. and host something hopefully very soon. Yes. Great. Everyone we listening. Thank you so much uh, for listening to this episode of taking care of the lady business. I'm Jennifer justice.